Brothers and sisters, once again, I greet you in the name of the triune God. As I continue to pray that grace and peace would be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. Let me invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the 19th chapter of the book of 2 Samuel. You know, it was back in 2005 that Amy and I got to take a special trip to Washington, D.C. with just the two of us. This was before we had kids. We had gotten tickets uh, somehow. I got a red-eye plane, and um, I went digging around through some of my old files. I even found a, a couple of pictures of us from back then. Uh, there we are in front of the Capitol building. We're in our 20s, I think, you know, very, very young. And uh, there I am with hair. Well, at least there was like... There was more hair at that point than there is today, but we had, we had a great trip. It was really fun. We went to some great museums. We went to the Smithsonian, and we went to the Spy Museum. Um, we even spoke with our representative, and he got us a tour of the Capitol building, a tour of the Library of Congress. But, but I have to say one of the coolest things that we did was a nighttime tour of all of the major monuments, uh, including the Lincoln Memorial. And you know, I'd forgotten until just recently, but if you go inside the Lincoln Memorial, then you will find a copy of Lincoln's second inaugural address etched into the marble of that remarkable building. You know, it was on March 4th of 1865, just 41 days before he was assassinated, that President Abraham Lincoln delivered his famous second inaugural address. It had been four years since the beginning of the Civil War, and in those four years, some 620,000 men had lost their lives. And it, it was in that context that President Lincoln delivered a speech that is truly unmatched in the annals of American history. And one of the most remarkable features of this particular speech is its brevity. The entire speech is composed of no more than 701 words, which is what makes it possible for them to etch it into the Lincoln Memorial. And I'll just read a few portions from it. He begins, Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. Neither party expected the war for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn from the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, Still, it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Why politicians don't talk like that anymore, do they? It's interesting, as, as Lincoln closes the speech, he brings a quote, he says, from 3,000 years ago. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous 
all together. That's a quote from the ninth verse of Psalm chapter 19, which not coincidentally is a Psalm of David. It's a Psalm that came from a man who knew by experience, just like President Lincoln knew by experience, just how terrible the Lord's judgment could be. Now we're back in the book of 2 Samuel this morning. And as you know, we have been walking chapter by chapter through the judgments of the Lord against David for his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. Now, you, you, <coughs> you might have noticed that in chapters 12 through 14, those judgments were pretty much quarantined to David and his immediate family. You might think of Amnon and Tamar and, and the child that Bathsheba lost. But in chapters 15 through 18, there's an expansion of those judgments. In chapters 15 through 18, those judgments really spread throughout the whole nation in the form of a civil war. A civil war that erupted between the followers of David and the followers of Absalom, which culminated in the death of some 20,000 men in the battle of the forest of Ephraim, which we covered last week. Well, now that David has uh, won the day, the time has come for him to try to reunite the kingdom. But as we'll see in the remainder of this chapter and in the chapter to come, the just judgment of God for David's sin has yet to be exhausted. Just as Abraham Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address to a divided nation, so too, 2 Samuel 19 is about a house divided. In fact, if, if you look at the, the very first verses of this section, so um, in your Bibles, it's probably under a heading like David returns to Jerusalem um, in the latter part of verse 8. Notice this. It says, now Israel had fled every man to his own home. And for the most part, when you see the word Israel, really from this point forward, you should be thinking about the northern tribes. So Israel, not Judah, is the idea. And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of, again, Israel, saying, the king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? And what's so remarkable about these first few verses is it's just Israel. You'll see this in a moment, but you move into the next section, and then you have Judah, and what you have is a very sharp division. That's the way that the chapter begins. Now, if you go to the very end of the chapter in verse 43, you'll see the same thing. And the men of Israel, those are those northern ten tribes, the men of Israel answered the men of Judah. We have ten shares in the king and in David also. We have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were not we the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. And so again, you, you have that division. What, what, what the author is doing in that is he's creating bookends. Verses 8 through 10, in, or in verses 8 through 10, you see a divided nation. In verse 43, once again, you see a divided nation. And that's the author. It's very intentional on the author's part. That's not an accident. It's a way of the author saying, that's what this whole chapter is is all about. It is about a house that is divided. So knowing that, let's just jump right into the text, with begin, which begins again in verses 8 through 15, where David negotiates to reunite the kingdom. That's what's happening in verses 8 through 15. David negotiates to reunite the kingdom. Look again at the latter part of verse 8. Now, Israel had fled every man to his own home. 
And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, the king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? So after Absalom was defeated, after his troops uh, returned to their clans, debates began to rage throughout the northern tribes about what, what the future of this nation is going to look like. We had anointed Absalom, but he's gone. We all know that we need a king. And so there was a question about whether or not to realign themselves with the kingship of David. And what's interesting is it was the northern tribes that were having this conversation. It wasn't Judah at this point. What's interesting about that is, is David was from the tribe of Judah. Ironically, his, his own kinsmen weren't having that conversation. And so in verses 11 and 12, David begins to engage in negotiations with that southern tribe of Judah, specifically. Look at verses 11 and 12. And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? Now remember, David is, is holed up in Mahanaim. This is to the north and just to the east of the Jordan River. And so he sends a message. He's utilizing the priests, Zadok and Abiathar. They're, they're his intermediaries. He sends them to try to handle negotiations with the tribe of Judah and to lobby for his return. And they basically have two points. Listen, all the other tribes have already thrown their support behind David. And David is one of your own kinsmen. Why would you hesitate to bring David back as the king? Now, I think lying underneath this is a real problem for the tribe of Judah. It seems that Judah had been exceedingly pro-Absalom. If you remember, the rebellion started in Hebron. Hebron is the very heart of Judah. It's their capital city, so to speak. Ahithophel, Absalom's chief advisor, was from Judah. Amasa, the general of the army, was from Judah. And so there was a real question in the minds of the people of Judah, if we bring the king back, what kind of reprisals, what kind of retribution will he take out on us? I think that's where the hesitation was. And that takes you to verse 13. And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also. If you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. <laughs> So th this is David offering a real olive branch. If you look back at chapter 17 and verse 25, just for a moment, as Absalom is rising to power, as he's getting ready to pursue David, in chapter 17 and verse 25, it says, now Absalom had set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Ethra, the Ishmaelite, who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, the sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. So as Absalom is collecting his army together, he puts his cousin, Amasa, in charge of the army. And David knows that. David knows that it was the army of Amasa that really engaged his army in the forest of Ephraim. And so he sends out an olive branch. He says, look, I, I want to bring the whole kingdom together. And in spite of everything that Amasa did to me, my own flesh and blood, he will be the new general over my army in place of Joab. And in doing that, he's doing two things. Number one, he's, he's currying favor with the people of Judah. He's showing them, I'm not interested in retribution. And number two, he's punishing Joab. Because you remember what Joab did last week, um, disobeying a direct order from the king not to kill his son, Absalom. 
Well, all that takes you to verses 14 and 15. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man. So David's negotiations are successful. So that they sent word to the king, return both you and all your servants. And so, so the king came back to the Jordan and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. So David takes a, a southerly trip from Mahanaim all the way on the east side of the Jordan. He ends up at one of the fords of the Jordan. There's several places where they would ford the Jordan, but this is you know, probably as good as any as far as a location where he might have crossed. So having successfully negotiated the terms of his return, David is now on the east side of the Jordan, waiting to be received by Judah and Israel. But before he does... There are three matters that need to be attended to. And so in verses 16 through 40, David deals with three people, Shimei, Mephibosheth, and Barzillai. And if you've been with us for a while, those names might ring a bell. I'll make sure to reintroduce each of them. We'll take them one person at a time. If you look at verse 16, the first of these individuals. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Baharim, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Now, you have got to think, if you remember the story, you have got to think that this was an anxious time for someone like Shimei. The last time we saw Shimei, he was cursing David. He was, uh, if you remember the Hebrew text, says he was dirtying him with dirt. He was casting stones and casting dirt upon the Lord's anointed, telling him, get out, get out, you man of blood. And so when when Joab tweeted that the war was over and that David was coming home, you got to think, Shimei probably called his therapist. He got a prescription of Valium. Like he, this guy's in trouble. He realized that this was going to be off with his head. Until he hatched a very clever plan. Look at verses 17 through 18. So he's he's hurrying down to meet the king. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and his 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. What was Shimei's grand plan? It was to bring a sizable Benjamite army along with him. And so he starts to collect his things and collect some people at Baharim. You see that kind of on the left in the middle there. If you remember the Mount of Olives is on the right. Jerusalem is going to be a little bit further than that. This is where Shimei lived. And he starts to make a trip. He starts to go north and east to the fords of the Jordan, bringing a thousand Benjamites with him. Why bring such a, a large showing of Benjamites? Well, a couple of things. Remember, first of all, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And there is still a lingering tension between the the reign or the dynasty of Saul and the dynasty of David. So there's something there. Um, And furthermore, if David were to kill Shimei just outright as he deserved, he's going to have to do so in front of a thousand of Shimei's best friends. That, That creates an awkward situation. So Shimei and his kinsmen, that they rush down to the Jordan to receive the king. You can imagine a scene, something like this. Everybody's kind of waiting on one side and starting to cross over. I mean, this is a large group of people. It's a thousand just from the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people involved in this. And fording the Jordan would look something like this, going from one side to the next, carrying the, the people and the things and children and women and, and everything that would go along with a dynasty like, like David had. Well, once they get to the other side, this is then Shimei launches into his best I'm sorry speech in verses 19 and 20. So he falls down in front of David and he says to the king, let not my Lord hold me guilty 
Or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, with a thousand of my best friends, to come down and to meet the Lord my king. Pretty good speech. He he owns it. There's nothing else for him to do. He, he absolutely owns it. And then in verses 21 through 23, we, we find Abishai again. Have you ever met somebody that, you know, if if you're a hammer, every problem is a nail? That's that's Abishai. And, and we've seen this before. Just listen to him once again. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this? Every time we see Abishai, he's trying to kill somebody. I mean, like every single time we see Abishai, this, he was a man of blood, as David said. Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? But David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? He brings Joab into it again. That you should this day be an adversary to me. Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know? that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. And so David threads this first needle pretty well. Remember the theme of the whole chapter is a house divided. This is an opportunity for David to blow it and for the whole nation to fall apart. But somehow he threads this needle pretty well. Now, admittedly, there's a little more to this story than what we find right here, but we're going to have to wait till the end of 2 Samuel. At the end of 2 Samuel, we're going to tie up a lot of these loose ends with people like Shimei and Joab and some others. But for right now, let's move on to the second character, which is Mephibosheth. Now, the last time that we heard about Mephibosheth, We heard about him from his servant Ziba, who told David that Mephibosheth was was actually in favor of Absalom's rebellion and was even hoping that he would be made the king. An incredible, incredible betrayal of David's generosity and kindness to Mephibosheth. Well, it's in this next section that David finds out that all of that was a lie. Look at verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. We don't know exactly how long that was. That was at least weeks. That could very well have been months of not bathing and not changing his clothes. This guy would have been a sight. You know, I was a youth pastor for a number of years and I smelled some terrible things. <laughs> but I got to think this would take the cake for sure. I remember one time the boys were just spraying ax all over the room and it just made it so much worse. I, I don't think there's any amount of ax that could have helped Mephibosheth here. It was just that bad. Verse 25 Oh, sorry, no, um, yeah, verse 25. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? Because all that David has in his mind is what Ziba told him about Mephibosheth being with Absalom. He answered, my Lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go with the king for your servant is lame. I love Mephibosheth's heart there. He, he could no more saddle a donkey than I'd be able to um, you know, saddle a horse right now. And so much worse because uh, he's lame. But he's like, I, I would have, I, I wanted to go. He has slandered your servant to my Lord, the King. But my Lord, the King is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you for all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my Lord, the King, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I than to cry to the King? That's a beautiful speech. Mephibosheth calls David, uh, my Lord, five times 
in that speech. He recognizes that you know, David is the only reason he's alive in the first place. And he calls himself your servant three times. He, he fully understand, understands what his place was. Now, let, let's think about that for a second. Put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes and ask yourself, what, what could he have actually done in these circumstances? Remember, he is severely disabled. He, he couldn't saddle that donkey himself. He can't do anything for himself. What, what could he do given that situation, given this, the utter betrayal of his servant Ziba? What could he do? There wasn't much. And so what did he do? I, I love this thought. He just did what he could. So what did he do? Well, he mourned for David. David was in exile. And so Ziba, or so Mephibosheth lived as if he was in exile as well. And he waited eagerly for the return of his Lord, the King. It reminds me of what Jesus said about the woman that anointed his feet with ointment just before his death. Mark 14, 8. She has done what she could. I personally think that's one of the most important verses in the New Testament. If you can get your head around that concept, it'll change everything for you. She has done what she could. There was a missionary named Don McClure. He used to tell a story about a, a little boy named Orup. Orup lived near Dr. McClure's mission station in the Sudan. And Orup loved to come to school, but he suffered from severe mental disabilities. And so he, he really he couldn't actually learn anything, but, but he would come anyways just so he could hear the stories. And Dr. McClure was thinking about Orup and trying to figure out what, what he could do for this, this precious little boy when it, it finally hit him. One day, he, he kneeled down to speak with Orup, and he asked him if, if he would like to carry God's book for Dr. McClure when he would go and preach in the various villages. And, and Orup was, was thrilled at the privilege. So every morning, Dr. McClure would walk out of his front door, and there would be Orup, and he would hand his Bible to him, and they would walk together to whatever village that Dr. McClure was going to be preaching at that day. And so Orup did what he could. One day there was a group of boys that were playing near a river when a, a crocodile snuck up and actually grabbed one of the boys. And all the other boys fled away for their lives, but, but not Orup. Orup dove into that river and he fought off the crocodile and he freed the boy that it had grabbed. But sadly, the crocodile turned its attention to Orup and, and took him. And there was almost nothing left to bury after he died. But even in his death, Orup did what he could. Well, shortly before his tragic death, Orup had told his mother that he was not afraid to die. And the reason why he wasn't afraid to die is because he knew that Jesus would come and take him by the hand and lead him home. And it was that simple testimony that led his mother to place her faith in Jesus Christ. All because Orup did what he could. You know, most of us play very small roles in this world. We go to work, we raise our kids, we try to run a business, most of us have very little influence, very little resources. But when you read the story of the Bible, you start to understand that God doesn't need people with power or influence or resources. Our God seems to be a God who delights 
in using people just like you and I who are willing to do what we can. People like Oreb, people like Mephibosheth. Now, the whole situation, getting back to the narrative, it does present something of a dilemma for David. As despicable as Ziba was, there's no denying the fact that he had provided support for David at a critical time. And without that support, it's very unlikely that David would have made it to Jericho and gotten away. And when that moment happened, David took all of the lands, which he had given to Mephibosheth, and he gave all those lands to Ziba. But now David has learned that Mephibosheth, well, he did what he could. He, he was not pro-Absalom, he was pro-David, but he was stuck in a terrible situation. And so David, again, has to figure out how to, how to thread this needle just right. And I think he does a pretty good job at it. If you look at verses 29 and 30, it says, And the king said to him, to Mephibosheth, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided. You and Ziba shall divide the land. So David takes the land that he had, takes all the land that he had given to Ziba back, and then he splits it and divides it between Mephibosheth and David. And I, just, I love Mephibosheth, verse 30. And Mephibosheth said to the king, oh, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely home. I think Mephibosheth is one of the most compelling characters in the whole narrative of First and Second Samuel. He's a very simple, very broken man who just did what he could. Well, all of that leads to the last character that David needs to deal with, and, and that's an old man by the name of Barzillai. You know, it was back in 2015 that I got a call from my dad that no son ever wants to get. I remember I was in the back parking lot. Dad called me in the middle of the day, which was kind of unusual. And he told me that he'd just been at the doctor's and they told him that he was going to have to have an open heart surgery uh, because his aortic valve needed to be replaced. And the surgery went, went very well. Um, they put a, a, I think it, they put a pig valve uh, where the other one had been. So he rolls around in the mud every so often, but, you know, <laughs> he's fine. <laughs> the surgery went very well, but you can imagine recovering from open heart surgery, crack the chest, the whole deal, open heart surgery. No matter how well the surgery went, that is brutal. It is a brutal recovery. Well, I was able to see dad kind of shortly after, and, and I noticed that he had this teddy bear that he just carried around with him everywhere that he went. And uh, you know, that's just a funny sight, seeing a 65-year-old man, you know, walking around with a teddy bear in his pajamas. And so I had to ask him, so what's dad, what's, uh, what's the deal with the teddy bear that you have there? Well, he told me that the hospital gave it to him. And it, it's, it was something for him to hold on to when he sat down or when he got up because it, it would assure him that he would use his leg muscles and not his chest muscles and was, would ultimately be a, a comfort to him. And what I noticed in the time that followed is that teddy bear, it was my dad's fast friend. <laughs> it, it was with him everywhere that he went. And, and eventually he decided to give it a name. And wouldn't you know it, the name that he gave to that teddy bear was... Barzillai. I was talking with dad about that this week, and this is what he told me. He said, thanks for asking. When I had heart surgery, that teddy bear really became my best friend because I was in so much pain. I think of the story of Barzillai and how he was such a dear friend to King David at the lowest point in David's life. And it meant so much to me that I liked calling the bear Barzillai. Well, we read about Barzillai in verses 31 and 32. It says, Now Barzillai, the Gileadite, had come down from Rogalim, and he went on with the king to the Jordan to escort him over 
the Jordan. Barzillai was a wealthy leading man from Gilead, and he had supported David when David was in exile in Mahanaim. He provided food and supplies for him. Verse 32, Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. Look, he said it, I didn't. But <laughs> I love that. A very, it's not just an aged man, a very aged man. <laughs> Easy. He had provided the king with food while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. In other words, he was a very good friend. In verses 33 through 40, record a conversation between David and Barzillai, where David thanks him and offers to do whatever he can to repay Barzillai's kindness. Barzillai uh, demurs, and he says, I'd really rather just go back home and be buried with my fathers. Um, and so it's a lovely little account, but I think that the point of this section is, is pretty clear. It's pretty straightforward. It just it reminds us of the exceedingly great value of good friends. J.C. Ryle said it like this. He said, this world is full of sorrow because it is full of sin. It is a dark place. It is a lonely place. It is a disappointing place. The brightest sunbeam in it is a friend. Friendship halves our troubles and doubles our joys. There's almost nothing in this world as sweet as a good friend. It halves our troubles, and it doubles our joys. You know, friends, that's just one of the many benefits of being part of a local church. Because by and large, this is where you find those deep and abiding friendships those people that walk with you through the worst things in life. That's one of the reasons why, you know, as a church, we, we try to put so much emphasis on, on the value of home groups. Because it's, it's one thing for us all to gather together like this on Sunday mornings, but there's a lot of us, and it's hard to get to know individuals well. And a home group, a smaller setting like that, that really does open the doors to really, really getting to know someone to really having a, a heart-to-heart kind of relationship, the kind of relationship that will half your sorrows and double your joys. That was Barzillai. That was a good friend. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the chapter begins with trouble in the latent antagonism between Israel and Judah. And then bookending that chapter in verses 41 through 43, David finds even more trouble. It says in verse 39, Then all the people went over the Jordan, and the king went over, and the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his home. And so you can see here, Barzillai and the king, they've gone, this is kind of looking from the west, they've gone down the Jordan Rift Valley, they've crossed the Jordan, Barzillai then goes back, and David is now on the other side of the Jordan in the promised land. He's back in the land. Verse 40, and the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham, Chimham I think was Barzillai's son or grandson, Chimham went on with him. And all the people of Judah, and also half the people of Israel, brought the king on his way. And so they leave Barzillai behind, and they go over to Gilgal. All of Judah comes, half of Israel. And then that takes us to the sad story of verses 41 through 43. Then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away? And brought the king as his, and his household over the Jordan, and all David's men with him. And as ironic as this is, this was written some 3,000 years ago. I find tremendous comfort in that. Church folk haven't changed much in the last 3,000 years. Seems like we can always find something to disagree about. And at this, in this case, it's who gets to carry David over the Jordan? 
All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all of the king's expense or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king and in David also, we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Church folk, if you've been in the church for a while, you know, you, you know how this is. So basically the, the chapter ends where it began. It ends with the house of Israel divided from the house of Judah. Dale Ralph Davis, he uh, was one of my professors in my doctoral program. I, I love his commentary on 2 Samuel. Listen to what he wrote. He said, most pastors get more than a taste on this point. How often on any given week I used to marvel that a congregation ever survived between petty bickering and flagrant sins, between hurt feelings and asinine stubbornness, between trivial priorities and tragic apathies. And yet it seemed that the fragmenting tendencies of human folly were always overcome by the glue of divine grace." Surely Jesus is building his church or it would have vanished long ago. That's, that's just right on. I mean, that's, he, he's nothing but right there. That's why Jesus said that a house divided cannot stand. And that is why Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 in his high priestly prayer. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Let's pray. Father, this is, it's such a human chapter. There's politics, there's hurt feelings, there's that stubborn, stubborn spirit that dwells inside each one of us to some degree. And yet somehow through all of it, Lord, you are making something beautiful and you're doing beautiful things. And so God, we rejoice in that. And we rejoice in the fact that despite the stubbornness of our spirits, we, we are just like Israel that you are building your church, that you continue to hold us together with the divine grace of, of your wonderful divine glue. And Father, you are, in spite of ourselves, using us to reach the least, the last, and the lost. And so, God, we, we celebrate that. We thank you for men like Barzillai. Thank you for men like Mephibosheth, for the examples that they set for us. And we would only ask, Lord, that, that we could follow in their footsteps as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.